Hi, welcome to Scorpio season. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm here today with my guest, Bankat. Hey, Lisa. The Scorpio season, and I'm here with my guest, Lisa. <laughs> hey, Bankat, do you have a snack that you're eating today? Yes, I do. I am eating kale chips, which we made at home ourselves. Oh, cool. Oh, that's really nice. Um, oh, they're crispy. They didn't look I guess that's why you call them chips, huh? Okay. Um, well, while yeah. you're chewing, and usually I mute myself when I'm actually eating my snacks so I don't like chew loudly. <laughs> but today I felt I should demonstrate the crunch. <laughs> crunch with a K, right? Um, I, uh, I'm drinking kefir, which is the... Most All right. Yeah. yeah, I like... Um, I've had that before. It's good stuff. Um, yeah, especially yeah. for a hot summer. All right, so we're doing something um, special today, right? So we're trying to do a stunt with the letter K. So what's the stunt? Uh, so the stunt we're pulling with letter K is we have 22 items that we're going to try to get through, talk through today. So it's the lightning fast K round. Um, I think, so we're gonna go through them and each of us is gonna take a turn just saying something quick about it, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, you wanna kick us off with uh, the first one? I'm going to kick us off with the first one, which I'm not sure I can pronounce correctly, but I'm going to try my best. Um, it's kakastocracy, um, which I believe is a, so I think I'm going to have to give a definition for this one just to make sure that I've kind of got it. But I believe this is like a bureaucracy that is basically turned to shit. Um, so a shitty bureaucracy would be a kakastocracy. Um, I think that, I think that most bureaucracies tend over the like you know how like in math there's like limits and like you approach the limit you can calculate what the limit that you approach is so like for some equations you approach two um i would say that most bureaucracies the limit that they approach is a cacistocracy in general the generalized form of bureaucracy like as you approach infinity um tends towards the cacistocracy cacistocracy all right so say more than a definition okay you've defined it so give us a take on your on cacistocracy Oh, that's, but is that not a take? Like the every bureaucracy oh, okay. as the limit as you approach it, it turns into a shitty. Oh, okay. I thought that well. was part of a, okay, yeah, that, that's a take. So the definition and yeah. the take is the uh, asymptotic limit part. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, my take, uh, yeah, I just Googled it to sort of refresh my mind. I thought the last time I read it, I, it said something like government by like basically uh, criminals or something. But um, Google tells me it's government by the least suitable or competent citizens of a state. So least suitable or uh, competent. And uh, my take is gonna be an example. So I'm just reading this book, A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuchman on uh, the 14th century. So the aftermath of the Black Death. And one of the interesting things that happened is right after the, uh, a major battle in the Hundred Years War called the Battle of uh, Poitiers, I think, uh, in France, between England and France, which uh, England won and then they kidnapped the King of France. So the government of France kind of fell apart. Uh, like the Dauphin, which is the sort of uh, uh, prince who's going to become the king in France. Um, he was an 18 year old sort of um, useless character who couldn't like do much, 18 year old. But it ended up being a contest between the knights who had lost the battle and um, sort of lost most of their wealth to ransoming themselves back from the enemy. And on the other hand, the merchants who were sick of the currency being debased and uh, sort of uh, being used to pay for wars and they were demanding reforms, economic reforms. So what happened in the aftermath of the battle and uh, Black Death is the knights who were the feudal noble role, uh, ruling class actually turned to uh, brigandage. Um, that's the word she uses. So brigandage as in like they turned into like just roaming bands of um, robbers, uh, just plain oppressing and stealing and robbing from peasants. So the form of government turned into like its worst form uh, uh, within a couple of years after the battle. So that's my example of cacistrocracy. Right, moving on to the next one. What do we have here? We have yeah, KKK. The, the KKK, which actually I feel like you just gave us a great jumping off point. Um, I feel like the KKK is... Oh, so one thing that I found really interesting in Hannah Arendt's um, Origins of Totalitarianism is that when she... Um, one like aspect of the Nazi party that was really important was like the levels of secrecy. So it was part of this like just like as you got closer and closer to like the core of it there was like a certain amount of um 
kind of like going into a secret society, like as you got into the party, um, which I thought was really interesting. I feel like the KKK is kind of like that a recreation of that secret, like um, behind the scenes, like terror that gets created by um, a certain amount of secrecy. Uh, which it sounds sort of similar to like your roving brigades of people causing mayhem um all in the but it's like a power it's definitely like a power play right so like that amount of secrecy and like behind the scenes like you don't know who we are we're masked men um yeah anyways okay yeah that's an interesting continuation from the 14th century so when you, know, you put KKK on the list, my you know, first, my mind first went to the origins of the term itself. So from you know, what I recall, Ku Klux Klan, it's named after sort of the sound of um, cocking a rifle, a bolt action rifle. So supposedly it sounds like that. And that kind of, um, I, I found it fascinating because it's interesting how these sort of secret societies and basically sort of uh, in-group tribal kind of like groups of any sort, they tend to form around fetish objects. In this case, the fetish object happens to be a gun and the name of the movement itself becomes like a, uh, the sound, onomatopoeic sound of um, uh, that fetish object. And in the 14th century, the knights kind of had their, you know, armor and lances and like there's a whole culture of um, gallantry around, um, you know, knightly weapons and stuff. So anyway, it's all um, one form of gun nuts or the other. So that's my quick take. Next. It was actually goes into our next one. So our next up is Klingon, uh, which is a um, uh, I, I'm, okay. So like clearly, this shows my level of um, expertise with this <laughs> topic, which is not that much at all. Um, uh, Klingon's the um, language used in Star Trek, so it's like a Star Trek related language that I'm guessing one of the like character classes talks. Like yeah. guessing. Um, interesting thing about, okay, so like interesting fact about Klingon is like at one point, so Klingon is like a, um, it's a, it's, it's almost like, it's, so it's a language and it has like, so there's people who speak it, right? So like there's people who currently study and speak it and use it like a, a full language, which is incredible because it's like made up, right? Which yeah. says something about um, languages that are not like made up, but languages, like the creation of a language system, like the fact that it's complete enough that people can learn it and stuff, um, it's actually interesting. And there's a couple other fan languages that are also have this like characteristic. I believe one of them is like Dothraki, which is like the Game of Thrones um, yep. language. I think at one point I was tweeting about this and someone pointed me to an AI generator, which will generate a fan based like language, like it'll make up a language. Um, I don't know exactly what parameters you put into it, but someone has like codified the process that you, because like building an AI, you have to like pick out the rules of language. So someone has built like a language generation machine um, based off of like Cleon and Dothraki, which I thought was cool. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's fascinating because uh, from what I, I read a long read about language, creating these artificial languages, mm. and there's like people who specialize in it, like career specialists who take like 15, 20 years to like develop languages. So I'm kind of like a skeptical how good an AI generated version of it would be compared to like something like Klingon, which experts spent like years developing. But uh, to continue with the theme you're riffing on, uh, two little uh, factoids, apparently more people speak Klingon than Esperanto, which cracks me up because Esperanto was like a, this serious effort to create a universal language and this completely fake language coming out of a TV universe is spoken more. The second uh, thing on your uh, riff direction is apparently people put a lot of thought even into making the Minions language. So did you ever watch uh, the Minions movie and the Minions are from, so it's a whole series of animated uh, uh, movies, um, the, I forget the first one, but it was like Despicable Me. Yeah, that's the series. Despicable Me. Steve Girl plays this cartoon Bond villain type character who's actually got a heart of gold, but he's got all these minions that are like little bouncy little characters, and they speak this sort of gibberish sounding language that's just like baby talk. But apparently, it actually is a sensible language. Like I whole, read a whole article about you know, minion language actually being a real language. So that's my first take on. Uh, Klingon stuff, but um, Klingon actually, it has a closer connection to a previous topic than um, um, you, uh, you might expect, since you don't seem to know the sort of background of the show. They're actually the strong honor society warrior race in um, Star Trek. So in the original Star Trek, they're kind of basically, um, you know, 
a knightly class of like uh, honor based warriors so they are that kind of race and it's a very guttural harsh sounding language which is kind of weird because if you look at human um, uh, ethnicities that have that kind of like strong warrior culture they tend to actually have slightly melodious uh, uh, languages which are full of like you know music and stuff so it kind of struck me as interesting that klingon on the show has this guttural uh, harsh sound to it but maybe that's something i'm just making up all right so that's klingon next karaoke all right king of musicality more yeah more musicality um i like okay so i i i like karaoke i don't do it very often um but it's always interesting to me to like who was i talking to i was talking to a friend recently who um who didn't like karaoke because oh gosh i'm going to totally blank on this this is embarrassing um it's an interesting so like karaoke is an interesting um social thing to do because like there's so like when you go out to karaoke with like a couple of friends um some of you are really good at it and some of your friends are usually like not very good at it and so it kind of becomes this like not like social pecking order thing but like a little bit of um like publicly displaying how good you are at singing a thing maybe i'm taking that the wrong direction but um i don't know i'm like i'm blanking out here go ahead no chat uh, i've never done karaoke and that's for a practical reason i think because I don't know any English songs well enough to sing and uh, as far as I know there isn't a karaoke culture around uh, Bollywood or Hindi songs so so you do need like a special backing soundtrack right to sing against for the vocals so uh, as far as I know maybe it's uh, uh, appeared since I left India but as far as I know it doesn't exist for Hindi music so I've never had uh, tried it but to your point yeah I can totally see that happening where there's good singers and bad singers and the job of the bad singers in like a group friendly outing is to make the good singers look good so you kind of have to like um, take one for the team by providing the bad contrast it's uh, kind of sad that's that's how humans work but hey <laughs> other people get to show off in other contexts where other people don't shine as much so that's good that's true though i have to say like so i started taking vocal lessons really late in my late in my late 20s um and then went out to karaoke at one point of like it was like a first date kind of thing and i felt really bad about it afterwards cuz i've never been good at doing karaoke i've always been terrible um and so i got up on stage and sang and came back and said like, oh my god you're such a ringer and i was like very like it was like i don't so i still don't believe him if that makes sense like i think mm-hmm. i can't tell if maybe he was like trying to flatter me but maybe i actually did sound good and i felt really embarrassed about having made everyone else in this bar feel bad or like sort of or maybe i wasn't sure it was like really stressful so karaoke is kind of stressful sometimes now you're going to have to sing for us at some point on the show i'm not making <laughs> putting you on the spot right now but you're going to have to sing for us at some point at some point yep okay now right, um, so we're done with karaoke where are we now okay yeah. next is k cups um All so right. this is like so this is like coffee machine this is like this is what i refer to here as like coffee machine that come with like individual size little plastic containers and you put it in the machine and push the button and then you get a cup of coffee out um I think that these okay so I, I I feel like my mom recently bought so my mom recently bought a K-cup machine and this kind of blew my mind because they have a coffee maker at home and I couldn't understand why she would want a single like personalized coffee maker um to have at home I guess like is this just like how Americans are like consumerization convenience like they just like the little like how much of the K-cup existence is like in a very Amer- it feels very American um and that makes sense like it's very convenient like you can it's very individualized like you could have one machine and 10 people could use it all get different types of coffee based on the coffee cup thing it produces lots of waste what do you think like that so i'm going to make this a show and tell because here i can actually show something <laughs> uh i am curious to see what you're going to come back with bankat so Uh, I'm with your mom and I don't think it's a particularly American thing because there are um, like um, European machines and stuff but I am actually sort of um, not a coffee nerd but I do have a bunch of different coffee making things but my daily coffee thing is actually an espresso uh, virtual so that's like a high end version of the K cup um, kind of principle so this okay. is what it looks like that's the capsule if you can see that on the screen and two things worth noting like I'm going to draw it close up here if you can see there's a barcode type thing around the rim of it do you see that 
yeah, I see yeah. it. It's really cool. And, uh, this is a double espresso uh, capsule, but this is like aluminum. It's recyclable, but it goes into this Nespresso machine. That's like, I don't know if, uh, if your mom's K-cup machine is like a horse-drawn uh, cart, like K-cups honestly make bad coffee. Like uh, the quality is like so terrible. I'd rather make my own pour over or French press or something, but this stuff is good. It's like really good. And um, so it's pressurized, it spins it at high pressure and produces a really good and consistent cup each time. And the reason for the barcodes is the machine is actually programmed to like brew at different temperatures and for different times with different amounts of water for each kind of coffee. So I have like a few different flavors lying around. So these um, cost about a buck a piece. So they're like Starbucks grade coffee at half the price. So that's one way to look at it. Or if you're the Folgers kind, you can say they're like 10x more expensive than a cup of coffee at home should cost. So it's kind of like how snobby you are about coffee and how much you're willing to pay for convenience. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely partly a convenience thing. So I love this stuff. Uh, but I do have other coffee as well. I make like uh, kind of percolated coffee and pour over and stuff. But uh, yeah, congratulate your mom for making a wise <laughs> life choice. But it's not, she doesn't have an espresso machine. She has like the K-cup version. She'll get is... there. She'll get there. She'll okay. eventually realize that K-cups are bad coffee and demand something better. <laughs> and then she'll get an espresso. I, Buy her an espresso as a gift sometime. As I say, this is what I should have gotten her for Mother's Day, which was... You know, it's a good gift for people who like coffee. It's expensive refills, but K cups I think are like fifty cents, um, thirty to fifty cents, depending I think on the brand you get. But I this see. is like twice as expensive, but like five times as good. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Hang on, I'm gonna check something really fast. Okay, cool. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, so next up is Killjoys. <laughs> um, All right. Which, okay, so I want to take, so I haven't really thought this through very much, but um, I think that, like, so I think you can kind of make, like, an interesting um, comparison. So Killjoy is someone who, in theory, pulls all the joy out of a thing, or, like, you're in a social situation, and everyone's having a good time, and then the Killjoy says something, supposedly, or takes an act in some way in which all of the joy immediately is sucked out of the situation. Um... I like, okay, so I kind of have this, like, working definition. So, like, I kind of want to, like, associate Killjoys with cringe. I don't think it's exactly, I don't think it, like, applies in every category. But I do think that, like, to some extent, like, cringe sort of operates in a similar theater as Killjoys. Because, like, so one working definition of, I seem to be really into definitions today. Um, one working definition of cringe that I have is um, cringe is, like, the words that rot to silence. So, like, so when someone says something cringe... Like, there's not really, like, a, usually, like, a cringe thing that's, like, hard to respond to. Um, so, I don't know. So, I, like, I would say that, like, cringe and killjoys are kind of, like, not two sides of the same coin, but definitely, like, siblings hanging out in the discourse. Discourse siblings. I think I'll, um, yeah, I think I totally agree with you. And I think I can see why they're related. Because both of them have this, um, uh, sort of um, effect of puncturing a false consciousness that everybody's sharing and actually enjoying, right? So you have like, say, people, I don't know, like we just talked about like um, karaoke, right? So that's a false consciousness bubble where people are just kind of validating each other's ability to sing. And we all know that ordinary singers aren't ever going to be like Grammy winning level singers, but it's fun to pretend for an evening that everybody can sing. But then if somebody says something like, yeah, this is all great, but you don't sound as good as, I don't know, Mariah Carey or uh, Beyonce or something. That's going to like kind of ruin the mood because it's, um, it punches the false consciousness bu bubble. And I think cringe does the same thing, except it uh, reverses the direction where it points at the person doing the puncturing as sort of the failure in the situation rather than the people inside the bubble. So uh, my sort of original example of uh, cringe that got me interested in the concept was uh, Michael Scott on The Office. Like everything he did was uh, kind of cringy and everybody would be like, it's like watching a train wreck unfold. But in that case, he punches like everybody knowing basically how to be polite and run a reasonable business meeting without causing awkward moments. That's a false consciousness, right? Like just being basically professional and not saying like stupid, awkward things. And he would puncture that, but make himself look really bad. So in that sense, it's related, I think. 
Yeah, that's funny. I can't watch The Office because of my <laughs> Scott. I just can't. I can't do it. Uh. It's too painful. All right. So next up, speaking of painful things, um, next up is karate. Um, I feel like I don't have anything. So, okay. My, my thing on karate, I guess, would be, I think it's an interesting aspect in terms of like, cult like cultural like phases. I mean, fads are a thing, right? Um, I feel like karate was more, way more of a fad back in like, I'm guessing here, like the seventies when like Kung Fu movies were like really big. And so like more people like did karate because that was like the cool thing that you saw, like, I don't know, it had like a cultural moment, right? Um, I don't even know, is karate like, I don't even know if karate, I'm gonna guess it's like this Japanese thing, but I really don't even know that. Like, is that like, is karate, like, I don't know, ninjas seem like they're related to karate, like, right? Karate ninja is like someone who's like really good at karate as a ninja. Um, but like, <laughs> that's like been out of the cultural consciousness for a while now. Like, it's not, karate and ninjas aren't cool anymore, but they used to be, uh, which is interesting. <laughs> If any like true martial arts fans are listening, they're going to be so mad at you because you're like mixing up so many sort of unrelated <laughs> things. Yes, karate is Japanese and it's, a, it's different from uh, ninjutsu, which is a, a separate martial art. And as I, uh, so I actually took a year of karate back in high school when it was still a fad. So this was, must have been like 1988 or something. I got to a yellow belt. Um, but uh, karate, as far as I know, it started in, I think, Okinawa as kind of like a peasant martial art when sort of the nobility basically banned uh, weapons or something. So they had to like uh, do unarmed combat or something like that. So it was like peasants have to fight one way or the other. And this is connected. It's kind of similar in spirit to capoeira, the Brazilian yeah. um, sort of uh, slave martial art, right? So it's, it's in that family of like peasant martial arts, whereas ninjutsu is uh, more like... Uh, uh, secret society, silent killer, uh, League of Assassins kind of stuff. So that so the usual contrast is made between ninjutsu, which is uh, ninja warrior type stuff, and mm -hmm. samurai. So samurai were the sort of more ceremonial, honor-based, knight-like um, martial artists who would like ride out in you know, open battle and fight with honor against enemies. Whereas ninjas were the sort of basically secret service who would like sneak behind lines and like do sabotage and damage and stuff like that. So three very different martial arts. But um, okay, what do I have to say about karate? So that was responding to your take. But my take is actually, uh, there's this absolutely wonderful essay by, uh, I think he calls himself David Wong, but that's not his real name. It's on Cracked. It's called How Karate Kid Ruined uh, Modern Life or something. And it's a lovely article that riffs on the Karate Kid movie, the original one with, um, have you watched it? The original Karate Kid? I think so, yeah. Okay, so the point it makes is, it. it, it, it it brings in a concept he calls effort shock, which is everything worth doing is much harder than it looks. And movies like Karate Kid ruin that because they give you this montage uh, kind of view of what it takes to acquire a skill. As in, like uh, in the beginning, Daniel San can't fight for now. Uh, not in, what's his name? Mr. Miyagi kind of like takes him under his wing and starts training him. Then there's like this five minute montage with like, you know, wax on, wax off kind of shit. And boom, suddenly he's a black belt and like beating up the biggest kid in town, right? And that's what uh, the article argues is effort shock. Whereas anything that you actually wanted to learn, it would probably take 10 years and it would make a very boring movie. So that's an article I strongly recommend um, to everybody to read because it's sort of a general commentary on learning curves. So that's my take on karate. Right. Okay. So speaking of learning curves, next up is knitting. Um, I actually, so I used to be a big knitter in college. I knit a lot. Um, I actually got in trouble and I would take you to classes and knit during class and like got yelled at in this like huge lecture hall once the professor stopped his lecture and like I was sitting in the back row of like a 200 person like lecture and he like stopped and was like, you need to stop knitting. And I'm like, what the fuck, dude? Um, anyways, <laughs> I'm like, how? how is me sitting here knitting like affecting you talking at the front of the room dude like just keep talking <laughs> like I'm clearly paying attention because my hands are busy like I don't know um anyways uh kn knitting so I used to knit a lot but at some point I gave it up because I realized I was just building fabric with my hands and that if I really wanted to make things with fabric I could learn how to sew someone else would make the fabric um it's like, and so knitting's interesting in that it's like one big piece of yarn 
that you make a lot of knots out of and it builds like, I mean, it's kind of like building a netting. Mm -hmm. you, you knit a net and then that net is the fabric and then you shape it into things and you wear it. Um, so how long were you a serious knitter? Probably like two or three years. Okay, and, and when was this? Uh, which year? Like freshman year of college. No, but what year? What was that, like 2000? 2007 to 2009. Okay. Uh, I'm asking because uh, I remember seeing that come and go as a fad. Um, and I think it was yeah. just starting when I was uh, finishing up grad school, like 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. So I was living in this um, uh, residential scholarship house, which had like students of all ages. And the incoming freshmen um, at that point, 2002, 2003, uh, one of them was a young woman who would like sit around in house meetings knitting. And I was like, this is an activity I associate with, um, you know, my old um, aunts and, uh, you know, mom generation. I don't expect um, young women, like especially like several years younger than me to be doing this. But it seemed to be a whole, it seemed to have its moment as sort of a whole thing. But I think it's actually persisted. And um, like um, a couple more things, uh, Sarah Perry, who um, was uh, for a long time co-blogging with me on Ribbon Farm, She's an excellent knitter, like a stunt knitter or something. Like she does all kinds of weird shit and she keeps posting um, examples of that and it's really impressive. So there's, I think uh, even if all you want is the fabric, so people who just want the fabric, then they can move on to making clothes out of it or something. That's one motivation. But other people, I think, like the challenge of getting more and more complex with the fabric itself. So, yeah. oh, and, and the last thing I wanted to say about knitting is there was a thing a few years back that I read uh, talking about more and more men getting into it, like um, middle-aged men showing up to knitting meetups and even having all male knitting meetups. And that, I don't know, I, I guess I'm old fashioned and gendered enough that that kind of threw me as this is something surreal from another timeline. But I don't know. Huh. Is that because you just, you associated so much as like women's work? I don't, well, uh, I think in the 20th century, it's not uh, work at all. It's a hobby. Like people who actually knit for a living do so in factories and big machines, right? Mm, so it's like commercialized uh, knitting is how actual commercial cloth gets made. So anybody who does it today does it as a sort of hobby or interest, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think it's um, it's just images in my head. Like I just don't have enough sort of machine learning sample images in my head that are in this weird new mode. So yeah, yeah, that's basically it. Like I don't actually have any opinions about it. No, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't knit. It's, I think that's, so you're saying the hobby thing. I think that's part of why I don't knit is that I realized I didn't want to spend my free time building fabric. It was just like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless you enjoy it, what you're doing is producing a kind of fabric at like 10 to 100 X the cost it would take to just buy it. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I mean, I made some All nice right. socks. Like, I love those socks. They're great. But yeah. All right. Next up, we have knockoffs. Speaking of. Perfect segue. Yeah. So knockoffs. <laughs> um, yeah. So when I think of, okay. So I think the most interesting thing I've heard about knockoffs recently is there's like this big company that recently, what's the name of the company that IPO that was like, their whole thing is resell goods but like fashion i'm not gonna be able to it's like not rent the runway it's like something else um i think i know the one you're talking about but i'm blanking on it as well yeah yeah but they were like so part of their problem with scaling is that there's like counterfeit or knockoff goods so like knockoff purses and so the interesting thing about like so knockoff purses is like a category right the problem with knockoff purses is that they get made by like let's say like people so like the name brand ones get made by a factory in italy and then the people who make the normal purses will like in their free time turn around and make some more purses that aren't officially sanctioned purses. And those are the knockoffs. So at that point, the knockoffs are basically coming from the same factory, just like the um, line, their lineage, like their parentage is like not considered like beautiful <laughs> pure. But it makes like, it makes the job of the like, so the problem with this like IPO or the reason why people were like kind of questioning the underlying value of this like whole store or company whose money or like, worth of value is built on their ability to like have good resale goods and like send these goods through counterfeit people who say no this is a counterfeit so we shouldn't have it listed on the site is that the ability to tell a counterfeit apart is really hard because the actual underlying good is in some cases 
really similar. In some cases, they're not at all, and it's probably pretty obvious, I guess. But sometimes, like for knockoffs, you actually do need an expert to be able to tell the difference, which I think brings up a really interesting question of like, what exactly is like you're paying for the authenticity, right? But at some point, you're also paying for like other people seeing you with the good. And so, if no one else knows that it's a knockoff, you're still getting all the benefits of having the actual item up until the point at which you run across someone who can tell you that you're not living in the universe you think you are, but in fact, are inhabiting a universe where you have purchased a counterfeit good. <laughs> uh, uh. So that, that's, uh, that's oh, oh, I'm hearing a big echo. Are you hearing an echo? No. Oh, hold on just a second. All right. Um, so if the same product has like a high cache brand name versus a knockoff that's exactly the same product and all that's different is that somebody else owns the thing as it's being made. I, I, it's like if there isn't an actual difference, then the difference is one that comes out of like association as in like, all right, this is um, the exact same thing except it's been sort of endorsed by the business owned by this famous celebrity or something. So it's like completely nebulous uh, stuff around it. Um, so that I think creates this, uh, I had sort of a cogent thought there. Uh, oh yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting that that distinction can come from two sources, right? One, one, if it's a material good, then there's like lots of expensive inputs to it. And then those, the knockoff can be sort of spotted by just being cheaper, right? It uses worse quality leather, worse quality like uh, uh, buckles or whatever. So that's one way a, a knockoff can be. But if it turns out that uh, uh, the quality difference, like there's no way to actually make the quality inputs any better. So it's all a question of margins and markups and all the knockoff person is doing is accepting a much lower margin and taking, selling it the same thing to you for less. Uh, what they're doing is uh, sort of almost calling bullshit on the original. And this is especially true of uh, uh, books, for example, like uh, to be honest, for most readers, the value of a book is just the text and if you are comfortable reading an ebook and you don't care about like first editions and like high quality bindings and stuff like that, and all you want is the actual text, it's like all that is like superficial, uh, superfluous materiality, and that kind of like lowers the uh, branding or I don't know pricing power of the original. Uh, so, all right, so I'm kind of wandering all over the place, but I'll close with uh, one sort of weak take, which is uh, the word ersatz has uh, recently become my favorite word. I don't know why I keep reusing the word ersatz. The, the world is full of ersatz stuff. Premium mediocre ersatz stuff. What All does right. ersatz mean? Oh, just a cheap knockoff, basically. Che oh, okay. Like, um, yeah. oh, okay. Except it doesn't even pretend to be sort of um, the original. It's just like openly, yeah, I'm copying this and I'm not the same thing, but if you want something similar, here it is. Cool. Okay. Ersatz, the knockoff word. Um, all right. All right. Next up, we have knockoffs. Okay. Uh, next up is knockoffs. Oh, no. Knockouts. Knockouts. Knock so KO. Yeah, yeah. Um, which usually when I see knockouts, I think of like wrestling, right? Like knockout is where the guy who's wrestling gets knocked to the ground and is like out of it. Um, I wonder if you could like compare knockouts though to like cancel culture. Like, so in some ways, like, um, <laughs> <laughs> getting canceled is like the Twitter, if Twitter were like a wrestling ring, getting canceled is the knockout version of, um, of like, of wrestling. So like, so like you want to avoid, so why, so why is getting canceled bad? Well, it's like getting knocked out in wrestling, you're like on the floor. And so there's a period of time that you have to stay down before you can come back up. Um, and like, so like, there's kind of a negotiation around like, how long are you canceled for? Like, um, and maybe this isn't exactly Twitter, but I know like Louis C.K. got canceled, right, for just being a pervert, and um, like he, it, like he's like trying to come back now, and everyone's trying to decide has he been on the has he been on the mat long enough? Like has 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 Louis C.K. spent enough time on the mat in Knockout Land? Um, which I don't know. It's kind of funny. 
uh, though there's a distinction though, right? Because in a knockout in a wrestling or boxing match, you can't get back up. Like in a, I, I don't know about wrestling rules, but in um, boxing, when you're knocked out, the uh, countdown to 10 or whatever that the referee does is literally to see if you can get back up within the time. And if you can't, he declares the match gone. You've lost it because you're literally like uh, two days to get back up. Whereas in cancer culture, it's like you're trying to come back. You can get back up, but they won't let you. So it's um, the timing factor is different in, in those two situations. But yeah, I like the analogy a lot. And uh, the way I would sort of uh, apply the more strict analogy to uh, boxing or wrestling knockouts is if you're, if you're say a comedian and you get canceled, you might get like truly knocked off. Like people might have like too much distaste for you to let you back in. So that's literally being knocked out, right? Even if you want to come back, you can't. And um, if, if uh, you're knocked out in that canceled sense for long enough, the culture shifts under your feet. Like, you know, stand up, we were talking about this last time, like stand up comedy culture goes through eras and like different eras of comics have different approaches. So if you're a, comic who's been knocked out for long enough that the era changes under you and now you're obsolete, that's um, kind of a true knockout. Like you've been knocked out of the game altogether. So that's like the, um, you know, boxing game ending. So that's yeah, fine. All right, that's next up we have kites. Um, so opposite of knockout, flying high. Um, I don't really think I have a whole lot to say about kites other than the fact that I've flown some as a kid on the beach like there's like so there's like a couple different kinds of kites right there's like the single string ones which are like fairly simple and then there's like the more complicated like two-handled ones that I feel like my biggest like memory of two-handled kites so there's like two strings and so by pulling on them you can make them do tricks in the sky because uh you kind of play off the tension of the wind and I feel like the the usual end case for that like two-handled kite maneuvering is like plowing towards me at like a million miles an hour because whoever's operating it has like lost control of the two things so they like tend to plummet towards the earth in like a super stupendous quick fashion i don't know kites ah, so a little bit terrifying kites i think we have had very different experiences with them you're talking about like really fancy high-tech american kites that are usually made of plastic and are meant to be like stored and kept for like a long time like you buy it as like a toy and it's like a durable object uh yes. growing up in india kites are uh, kind of like a part of like traditional culture and typically you have these extremely simple like square kites that are made of very thin tissue with like um very fragile wood frames and you might buy like um, half a dozen at a time and they're kind of meant to be disposable and these are really cheap, like even growing up by Indian standards. Uh, so they'd be the equivalent of like um, 25 cents. So 25 pesa was actually like less than a penny. But uh, in sort of purchasing power parity sense, uh, it would be like buying a kite for 25 cents in the US. And the culture around them, there's like a tradition of um, kite fighting. So that's common in lots of parts of the world, but I don't think it's that popular in America. But kite fighting is basically... Uh, you take the kite string and say the last 10 yards or so just before it attaches to the kite, you cover it in like gum and um, powdered glass. So it turns it into like this deadly cutting wire. And the way you fight with kites is you fly them up in the air and you try to cut the other guy's kite string and cut it down. And then if you can find it, you basically win that kite. But that's sort of the centerpiece of kite flying culture in India. And I think Afghanistan, Pakistan, all those sort of uh, South Asian countries have this culture. And it's actually a big part of some festivals. So there's one called Sankranti, which is basically the harvest um, festival, kind of like uh, what, kind of like Easter in the West. So it's like the Easter equivalent festival ha harvest season. And the big centerpiece of that is huge kite flying competitions where people fight, enter contests, uh, fight with each other and stuff. So these are all very simple kites. So, I was never good at them, but I did every season. I would buy a few kites and try to fly them. Uh, I always saw some of my cousins who I visited um, during vacations. They were really good at it and they would like enter competitions and stuff. Um, but, but this, these are like very traditional kites that are really hard to fly. So they're not, uh, you know, modern and advanced. So they're not easy to fly. And you can tell the difference. So like I would struggle to get them off the ground and stay up for like more than 20, 30 seconds. Whereas my cousins would be, they'd be like up in the stratosphere, like uh, half a mile up in the sky and like steady. Like one time my cousin let me hold the kite. It was like literally holding onto a rope that you could climb. It was like that steadily anchored way up in the sky. And he was fighting with somebody else. I think he won the contest. 
but yeah, so that's my experience of kites. Very different from the American experience, I think. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of sounds like jousting. Uh, yeah, it is like a very like uh, suitable for kids, not as dangerous, but it can get really dangerous. Like people cut their hands and stuff on that uh, fighting kite string. And there have been cases where with like some gust of wind, the kite can like uh, wrap around your neck or something and cause even more serious injuries. So it's like a fairly dangerous sport if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, that so. sounds like it. Uh, cool. All right. So we've made it halfway through our list. Should we do a couple more and then call it for the day? Oh, wow. How long did we take to get this far? 45 oh, minutes? I think we've gone. Yeah. All right. Let's do a couple more and uh, wrap up. All right. Do we want to just keep going down the list or do you want to like... Yes. Let's do, uh, go down the list. Keep going down the list. All right. So do you want to start since we're on the back half? Just kettles? Ah, okay. Kettles, kettles, kettles. Um, well, I have an electric kettle that I use every day to heat uh, water for my pour work coffee. So I drink that too every day. And I've lately been drinking hot water. So I've been using that. But uh, yeah, other than that, I don't think I have much to say about kettles. I just, you okay, so I think the fact that you own an electric kettle, so like Texas, there aren't, no one owns electric kettles in Texas unless you're not from Texas. Um, I own an electric kettle now, but that's because I spent time on the West Coast uh, where everyone and their mother has an electric kettle. Um, which I just think is kind of interesting because they're so much faster than like, I use it like I'll boil water before. If I need boiling water for pasta or something, I'll put it in the electric kettle first because it's so much faster than putting it on the burner and heating water up. Um, I don't know what that says about anything really other than, yeah, uneven distribution of like things. I don't know. I feel like kettles got a sort of a bigger thing. So like, there's like, I have like a kettle that's like big for like a lot of water. And then there's also like these more fancy little cute kettles that are for coffee. And you, you don't, you wouldn't really use a coffee electric kettle for boiling water to put in pasta because like the amount of water you need doesn't work out. Um, maybe, yeah. East Coast, I feel like East Coast electric kettles are like the fancy coffee kettles. West Coast electric kettles are the, um, like big, I'm gonna make a bunch of tea or a lot of water in general. I might be wrong about that, but I'm just bullshitting. Here. I think I've seen all kinds of kind. I have actually was made specifically for pour over coffee, so the mm -hmm. Japanese Hario style, so, but it yeah. makes quite a lot, so I can fill up my flask in the morning as well. But um, I think I've, uh, I've had a uh, sort of um, gas uh, flame, like stove top kettle as well in the past, like the kind yeah. with a okay. really flat bottom that heats up fairly fast. Mm -hmm. And I was like, um, the electric, uh, it, it, this is like classic uh, knockoffs uh, territory. Like it, it might seem like there's something like, I don't know, um, ineffably awesome about like a traditional kettle that sits on a fire and then like whistles and then you make your water that way. But, yeah. I mean, it's just boiling water. It's like such a basic function that there's, uh, there's no mystery or cachet to the stovetop version. So unlike many other things, like, you know, um, uh, like some things I do like um, cooking on a flame, but water is not one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I have had a, I've had a, I used to have a stovetop one since college, basically. Like... All right. Keep up, keep up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess I do have opinions on this quite a lot, actually, since my wife is a Korean, though she was um, uh, raised in America, she doesn't speak Korean. Uh, but my mother-in-law grew up in Korea and she watches Korean TV all the time. And I have watched quite a lot of Korean TV and shows. And most, it seems like half the TV shows, like soap operas and stuff, are built around K pop uh, behind the scenes stories of like the singers who go into the K pop machine and uh, the kinds of lives they live. But it's like, um, as I don't like the music itself, but um, it's amazing just how much of a machine like uh, thing it is. Like, to take uh, people, put them through a machine and produce bands at the other end. It's it's quite amazing, even though I don't appreciate the music. Is there like, okay, so I don't know a lot about K-pop. It sounds a lot like how we used to have like the boy band production machine back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, yep, yep. where like NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and maybe the Hanson brothers even were considered like, yeah. I'm sure that there have been more iterations since then. Um, like maybe the It's exactly that. In fact, I think it was directly copied from that. And the only difference is in Korea, it's actually a state-sponsored soft power initiative. 
So the Korean government decided that this is the right way to project soft cultural power throughout Asia. And uh, they basically created a bunch of programs. It's called, uh, uh, I think, Hallyu, H-A-L-L-Y-U. I think that's the sort of broader cultural soft power concept. And um, there's um, there's really good book about it. It's called The Birth of Korean Cool by, uh, I forget her name, Yunji Chao or something. Uh, I'll look up the book name, but the book title is Birth of Korean Cool. It talks about how it, they almost created this cultural machine on a war footing. So it covered things like K-pop, um, television soaps, uh, movie making. So Korea is famous for like lots of weird slasher movies. And these are like incredibly popular all through Asia. Like you go to Thailand, you go to Singapore, everybody's watching like Korean stuff all the way, everywhere. So, so it's amazing that the state sponsored cultural production machine actually worked. Like, yeah. And some of the shows are good. I like some of the TV shows at least. Yeah, actually so really on the state sponsored stuff, one, in, one thing that blew my mind a bit when I first went to Brazil and finally got to where I could talk to people is that my friends, like we were all college kids, were asking me like if it was true if the United States government had a rule that every video, every movie that got exported had to have an American flag in it somewhere. Um, and it was, that was like mind boggling to me that like foreigners would think that our, one like understanding so much about like American media, because when you live here, you just don't even think about it. Like it's just what's, it's, it's just like what you, the air you breathe, right? It's like American media. Um, but that they like, one thought the state had anything to do with it was like, and that it was like some cultural, like kind of like a psyop. They like really thought that like American movie production was a bit of a psyop. And that was like totally blew my mind. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to hear that like the Korean one was like actually definitely architected that way. Not to say that yeah. there, there might not be some amount of that in the American stuff that I'm just not aware of, but. I think there definitely was a little bit of that in the at the height of the Cold War. Uh, uh, like um, uh, uh, there's this whole thing about how a lot of modern art, abstract expression, expressionism and stuff was basically CIA sponsored and uh, we should go down the money trail sometime. Um, but a more recent one is actually China does a lot of this in importing. Um, so uh, an interesting example is uh, Top Gun. So Top Gun sequels have come out and then the original in the 80s. And people spotted this minor difference. The um, jacket that Tom Cruise wears, it's the same one that he wore in the 1980s movie. But there's been a subtle change, a little sort of campaign badge thing that uh, I think relates to some Taiwanese conflict or something is now gone because it's sort of a way, um, appeasement of the Chinese market. So this happens all the time now. Like anything, if you want the Chinese um, market, you kind of have to like censor it. So uh, South Park did like a really good three episode arc, like basically satirizing that. But yeah, so it's, I think if you're a superpower, you definitely do it whether you want to or not, and it can be deliberate or conscious or not. It's interesting to see a small country like Korea do it. That's kind of, and especially do it so well that it works across an entire continent with much larger countries. So yeah. Uh, All right, should we stop there? Yeah, we can stop there. I would say, but yeah, that sounds good. Um, All right. Uh, how far did we get? We got to, I think, uh, 13 out of our 22. Not bad. Yeah, yeah a little over halfway. Yeah. So the letter K is rich in possibilities. <laughs> we should Very do this format once in a way in the future again. Complex? I don't know. I think yeah. we just took the time to brainstorm a lot more candidates. Like uh, if we wanted to, we could do this with almost any letter, except maybe, I don't know, X or something. I do think it's funny that last episode we did too, and this episode we're like, as many as we can fit, let's go. Yeah. It's like high weights, low reps versus low weights, high reps. Like last yeah. time we did like a really heavy lift on Jane Jacobs. And this time we've done like, I don't know, 13 uh, lightweight reps on 13 topics. Yeah, you know, it's funny though. I was doing, I was editing the Jane Jacobs stuff and I was like, there's so much more I should have said on like every point <laughs> I made. I was like, there's like 10 more things I need to talk about. Um, and, and you could go that deep on any of these K topics as well. Like, I mean, let's, uh, if you look at the most trivial one here is probably K cups. It's like a um, small piece of consumer culture coffee, but I could probably talk for two hours on <laughs> everything related to that. So it's like things are as deep as you want them to be. Yeah, that's true. 
That's cool. Actually, okay, if we have like a few more minutes, I want to hear, I do want to hear about these two that you put on here that I don't know what they are. Oh, so okay. So, right. or, like, uh, I won't say much about Kairos, but it's just one of the three um, Greek gods of time. So Kairos is kind of like subjective time, whereas Kronos mm -hmm. is objective time. So I do a lot of writing about the Kairos Kronos distinction. But the other one is um, Nudsen. That's with a K, K N U D S E N. So mm -hmm. Harry Nudsen is this really important character in the history of um, industrial technology who I'd never heard of until like two months ago. And I'm reading this book called Freedom's Forge, which is about the American um, war mobilization effort. So Nudsen started his career working for Henry Ford. And a lot of the credit that Henry Ford gets for the assembly line and pioneering how automobiles were made, it was actually Nudsen's work. Like he figured out like the earliest forms of like efficient assembly line manufacturing and stuff. Then he, he got so important that um, I guess Henry Ford started getting jealous of him and they started competing a little. So they couldn't continue working together. So Nudsen went off and started working for GM across um, town. And uh, at that time, Ford was like way ahead of GM and Chevrolet was the GM brand that was like the dog of the family. And Nudsen basically took up the challenge of he's going to beat Ford at his own game. And he did that. So Chevrolet is actually a more interesting car, the 1920s, 30s car than uh, um, the Ford Model T or whatever, because it pioneered so many things, annual model changes, any color the customer wanted, rapid tooling changes on the assembly line. And he did all this and he took Chevrolet from like the dog of the market to beating Ford and eventually selling four times as much as Ford's equivalent uh, models. And it took till 19, the mid 1980s before Ford um, like had pulled one ahead of uh, Chevrolet. So that was like a huge victory. And I think Nutson is like way more interesting a character in the history of automobiles uh, than Henry Ford. But if, if that had been the only thing he, he did, he would still be a massively interesting character. But that wasn't even the most interesting chapter of his life. So he rose to become the president of GM. And um, by 1938, he was like the titan of the industry. But then World War II broke out. And uh, Roosevelt basically called him up and said, hey, I want you to run the American war mobilization effort. So he was the guy who basically thought through and figured out how to completely mobilize the American economy and build everything from tanks and aircraft engines to like uh, socks for soldiers and uniforms, everything. So at one point, Nutsen was running not just most of the American economy in service of the war production. He was actually running most of the British and French uh, war production efforts as well, because by the time Britain and France were already sucked into the war, they couldn't produce their own stuff. So they were like shipping all their gold uh, to pay for American production of the armaments they needed. So for a couple of years there, Nutsen was like orchestrating an effort to meet the entire rearmament needs of the US while meeting civilian needs and fulfilling all the war contracts that Britain and France needed to continue fighting. So really impressive um, guy and he kind of did this and nobody's ever heard of him and everybody's heard of Henry Ford. So yeah, that's why I put him on the list. That's cool. <laughs> kind of like, so there's, it kind of reminds me of like the Steve Jobs Wozniak sort of, sort of thing and that like Wozniak was like the technical genius and like Steve Jobs is like the marketing genius, I guess we can call him that. Um, Though in that case, I would say they both get appropriate amounts of credit for their roles and uh, thing. In this case, if it were that way about um, in Apple, then uh, Wozniak would be like 10x the figure he actually is and would have like uh, taken over Microsoft as well and um, invented uh, Google and Facebook as well. So that's the level of impact Nutsen had because imagine he like basically got forward to where it was then went over to GM and sort of uh, outcompeted himself. That would have been like if Wozniak had gone over to you know, uh, Microsoft and did the same thing with the PC world and then gone on to invent Android. So that's kind of the level of um, things Nutsen did. So yeah, kind of fascinating. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, Venkat, I think that's all the time we have for today. It's always a pleasure to have you on Scorpio season. All right. Always a pleasure, Lisa. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. 
Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.